Because you, you're about to go to Central and South America. No, actually, we Just we come from Mexico, so we've spent two months in Mexico, right. and and and, uh, and then on Friday morning we go to Brazil. Right. Yeah. Um, and Brazil is is very interesting. Was uh, we've been doing a lot of reading uh, to research the research, mm. <laughs> which is maybe typical of our. Uh, day and age um, so we've been reading a lot of uh, uh, Eduardo Viveiros de Castro who's a very interesting Brazilian anthropologist mm. whom I came across in 2013-14 when we were in Sao Paulo doing a big project and also uh, an American anthropologist called Eduardo Cohn mm. And they're they're sort of the same family, but they they look at they look at basically what Eduardo Viveiros de Castro said that when you have a meeting between two cultures, there's always one always leaves a trace of the other, mm. and it's something that you feel very clearly. I think when you put on those goggles and you you travel in Brazil, you see that there's a um. See, Putting on those goggles in Mexico reveals mm. very interesting things, and and having travelled a little bit in Arizona and, and met some indigenous artists there, sort of again opens. It's like okay, you know. Um, but the the relationship here, I think, is particularly violent, and I I we've been talking a lot about it, but I don't know why that is, mm. whether that is English culture or just something that happened, I don't know, it's very, very strange. But the tension is, is really, really tangible and still there. Mm. Do you find that about the United States generally, uh, coming here from, from living in uh, Paris? Europe. I remember what what struck me was back in the days I can't even tell you but I've done quite a bit of teaching in art schools here and mm. and as we all know artists tends to be sensitive people and just talking you know just doing crits really sort of brought to to surface the the violence of people's lives and it's not a visible violence, but it's something that was that's simmering there. Mm. Um, I think in my mind, for instance, you see it how people relate to drugs, both legal and illicit recreational drugs. Mm. Um, so there are cracks, and it's kind of seeping out. But I do, I in in my in my mind, I think that American society is is incredibly violent, but I couldn't say that whether that whether it's more violent or whether it just is a different expression of violence. Mm. I, I couldn't really say. It is something that 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 fascinates me and that terrifies me when I'm here. Mm. I think it's interesting when I go when I go to Europe. I so I've lived in Australia for 30 years and, you know, never, when I grew up in the UK, never went to Europe. Yeah. And then I was, <laughs> in recent years, actually gone to Europe. And there is, uh, the thing I, the, the thing to me is, uh, as kind of a European, but as an outsider as well, when I go to Europe, there are so many um, traces still within the landscape of the violence of the Second World War. Mm. And, and the first war to some extent, but uh, and a lot of it is, you know, a lot of the destruction, you know, particularly when you go to somewhere like Berlin, uh, Berlin has kind of been developed up for re reunification to the extent that you would never really know that they were those massive no man's land kind of areas that were there after yeah. the war came down. Um, but there, there is still, I think, a sense of this having been a landscape that was subject to total war for, you know, a long period of time. Yeah, and I think that there, you know, when I come to America, there there isn't the same sense of that in the landscape because 
nothing yeah. of that kind of, you know, nothing of that kind has ever happened um, in terms of a, sort of an international war um, in America. And I think that there's a reminder, the reminders are much more present, even though they're only in traces, but they're much more present in Europe. Mm. It's, it seems to be a more recent memory that well, it's interesting that you say that because I remember when um, going back to Sweden, I, I have a, a friend, a colleague, a, a French artist who lives in, in Sweden. And of course, it's interesting for us, you know, having swapped countries, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about this was after the, um, the shootings on uh, November 13. Mm. Um, and we were talking about, I was saying that I always found it really fascinating because living in, in France and living in Paris, you, there are always sort of crises. So there's like, uh, anyone who's been, been to France knows that, knows that there, there are strikes mm. the whole time. And that that's... The jury's <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it's very disruptive, but everyone deals with it in a in a very collective and in a very very. In, it's a quite an in, it's not an enjoyable experience, but it's a, it's it's something that sort of gives faith in in collectivity and humanity, and because people are very nice about it, you know. Yeah. So, for instance, you know, there's a there's a um, a tube strike, and there's one in five tubes, and in rush hour, it just gets completely insane. Mm. And you have people freaking out and rather than sort of saying, God, you know, uh, can't they, you know, they'll be like, yeah, I know that happened to me two months ago or, you know, in the strike in 2000, blah, blah. So there's, there's a sense of when there's a crisis happening and, and, and I think everyone was really, really shocked by the shootings and particularly because it happened just after Charlie Hebdo and all of that. And, and so my friend was saying, but that it goes back to a sort of a sense of sticking together during the Second World War. Mm. And because she, she kind of finds Sweden quite terrifying because that collectivity doesn't exist. And of course, Sweden hasn't had an armed con conflict for 350 years. So maybe you're right. Maybe the, the collective memory of something like that and, and the constant reminders of it um, do give a kind of a cushion mm. socially. So it's an I interesting think that, thought. I think there's a sense of uh, the inevitability of rebuilding that comes out of that experience yeah. rather than the idea that, you know, if something happens, that society will be destroyed and never recover. Yeah. I think that when you when you think of the scale of destruction that happened in not not just Europe, I remember going to Hiroshima a few years ago yeah. and walking around this place and going, "Wow, this was flattened yeah. out of existence at yeah. some point, and now there is a massive, you know, modern city there." Yeah. And I think um, when you think of the the relatively short time scales, you know in places like that, that yeah. there is a sense of the inevitability that things always return. Yeah. And I think it is, I mean, I, I had the, um, I had the luxury of traveling. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's again, it's a, it's a difficult term, but I had the, the, and I can't really say pleasure either, but I had the, the good fortune might be the good term mm. of traveling with a, with a friend and a colleague who'd been in the camps and went back to Auschwitz with her to visit where she'd been. Right. Um, mm. And it's one of those things that, that, that changes perspective. And I think that what we're living through today is, is so similar to what happened during the Weimar Republic that it's sort of, it, when I think about it, it gives me goosebumps. Mm. But then again, it, it is, I think that I cannot separate, because I also lived in, in, the, in, in Berlin as the wall came down and sort of seeing, because before the wall came down, the presence of the war in Berlin was really tangible, mm. it was literally everywhere. And I think that that is, I think that I, I consider that, I consider myself to be fortunate, obviously, to have lived through that peacetime. But it also, it also, 
shows how frail things that we take for granted are, mm. how frail this peace is and how frail this collectivity is mm. and, uh, and how we need to do whatever we can to, to safeguard it and, and that's also where the historicization, history, blah, <laughs> difficult word, um, is so important. Yeah. Um, and and I mean I I thought it was I thought it was terrifying when this NSA thing happened a couple of years back and people were like yeah but we're doing this to to protect you from um, from terrorists and I was like yeah but can you imagine what Ceausescu and you know. Yeah the East German government or whatever you take any of these governments what they'd done if they'd have access to Facebook and mm. and Twitter and it's not you know it's not and that is that's that's relatively recent mm. it's 27 years ago it's not you know yeah that's true I often I mean because I'm on you know I'm on Facebook I've got Twitter accounts, Instagram, etc., and I am constantly uh, battling with myself that you know I am kind of hooked on these things. Yeah, yeah, no, we are, we're, we're all, and they're made, they're made to be addictive, aren't they? Mm, absolutely, yeah. And in some ways, uh, you know, there, there are very positive things about that, like uh, keeping in contact with friends I grew up with in the mm -hmm. UK, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, um, and. At the same time, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm essentially, when I'm putting my life online, I'm, I'm essentially handing over that information. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it's a very, it's a very, sometimes I think it's a very cunning exercise of power that um, we're seduced into um, being complicit in. Yeah. I mean, it, it becomes very difficult to, I mean, I have friends who, who've decided not to. Yeah. Um, but it becomes very difficult to operate, you know, when you organize events, when you do things, you know, yeah. if I, if I, if we don't use social media, it becomes very difficult because we don't, we don't have an audience and that sort of mm. defeats the purpose. So it's, it's a, it's a very tricky, tricky situation to be in. Mm. Um, and we use we use these devices the whole time, and we. But I th I think at least there should be a kind of a, a more intelligent discussion around it, and what what can we do, and you know what kind of. Why do we just submit to the fact that you know all these companies basically? I don't know whether they sell it or they give it to the to mm. the U.S. government. We don't even know what it is that they do and how it operates. But I mean. Um, looking at whatever they're called, Cambridge Analytics, who supposedly swung both the election here when Trump won and also swung the, the, the Brexit, you know, there's, there's real power there. It's, it, it does have real effect on, on, on our lives. Um, and and I, think it's, I think it's very strange that there, is, there isn't more of a, of a dialogue about that, or maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm missing out, I don't know. Mm. Do you think, because one of the fears I suppose I have is, um, I sometimes think that we live, in terms of democracy and any real kind of meaningful sense of freedom, we yeah. live through the peak of those times. Well, I guess that's up to us, no? Mm. I think that democracy is not, I, I think that like anything in life, democracy is a process and, and democracy is about, um, I think there's a misconception that uh, democracy is about consent or um, that, we sh that we should all agree. I think that, that democracy is a platform for conflict within yeah. sort of functional terms. And it's about having different opinions and that those opinions and, and worldviews should be able to clash. Um, 
but I, it's also clear that that democracy was not ready for social media for the whole digital revolution. So the question is, how do we, what do we do to to make sure that it doesn't backfire? Mm. And I think that you, it's whether whether we we have the peak behind us or in front of us is is entirely up to us. Mm. Because I think the the interesting thing when the internet came along and then social media really, which was kind of the second wave of it, um, it was seen as a democratizing thing. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the, the outcome of that has been, um, you know, we think of democracy as voting, you know, for a singer on The Voice, you know, or <laughs> to evict someone on Big Brother. And those kinds of, you know, types of interaction yeah, but 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 I think yes. that isn't that the misconception that you know I I think that democracy is is something it's like mm. everything in life it's an everyday thing that you yeah. try to to work on it's not like going to the ballots that's just the sort of oh yeah, it's 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 it is things like you know uh, a free press and an independent judiciary and all those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, but it's also meeting whatever it is. It's it's your everyday. I mean, I think in that terms, I think that Foucault is right. Is like it it is how yeah. we act in the everyday and how what kind of choices we do as consumers or whatever it is. I think that's that. Yeah. So that so that I think that is where where. I mean, even, I mean, that is where whatever revolutions, whatever big changes happen, it happens when people change their, their everyday behavior. Mm. Um, and, and the question, it's always, I think that humanity or, you know, has been up against this since day one. Mm. It's about how we decide to, to deal with things in, in our everyday life that will determine what kind of future we're going to going to meet, mm. and and that is annoying because it's again it's about dealing with complicated difficult issues and doing on a daily basis, which makes life more demanding, but also makes life more interesting. So we're back where we started. Mm. How is your work now then articulating uh, these? larger themes and you know well trying to I mean first of all trying to address these issues trying to kind of think about what we can do individually and collectively to 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 work for a more humane society and I think that it is for me what I've done is working interdisciplinary is really so far the only tool that I've found to counteract this this the the movement that that the negative aspects of because obviously there are, there are good things happening as well in 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 mm -hmm. our day and age but to counteract these these negative aspects the only kind of tool that could possibly offer a, 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 some kind of solution is interdisciplinary work. Um, and because interdisciplinary work forces you to ask these questions. So when we're artists, talking to artists and sort of in the comfort of the art world, we, we focus on our everyday battles. But um, once you're when once you're forced to explain what you're doing to somebody who comes from a different background with a different set of notions and who usually have very sort of sketchy ideas about what art is and, and often antiquated ideas about what art is, you have to explain to them what it is that you're trying to do and that is a very, very good exercise and, and for whether they're um, writers, musicians, uh, neuroscientists, or whatever they happen to be, for them to do the opposite is also a very, very good exercise. So, mm -hmm. I, so I think that doing that is is one aspect, and then the other aspect is trying to make the audience as as active as possible. 
trying to I try to remember who said that it's not about it's not about filling the bucket it's about feeding the starting a fire in relation to education I think that's kind of what I or we collectively try to do is is try to start these conversations provoke thoughts um, how can we think differently how can we act differently what are the what are the what are the issues that are important and because I think that often and and I think that that the the Trump administration is a very good example of that is trying to fix the problems with the tools that created them in the first place mm. and obviously we need new tools and 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 those I think need to be but this is just one my humble opinion but they need to come out from outside of western thinking mm. um, so try to think out of the box try to try to stay on our toes try to think about the things that that really are interesting that really are important that really go to the depth and that really make us excited and and it's fun you know administration control systems are not fun nobody enjoys them everybody hates them so okay let's can we think differently about this they're not they don't make us more humane they make us they turn us into machines you know they turn nice people into quite unbearable <laughs> mm. so trying just to pull back and say what do you want you know what's important for you what is what are the what are the things that you would like to change how can we think about changing them being together having a, a real sense of collectivity i guess